Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Ask the Vet uh, with Dr. Tom Tolley. Welcome, Dr. Tolley. Hey, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Friday. Here again. Yay. Right. I think this is like our 14th webinar with you on Ask the Vet. I think we're on number 14 right now. Wow. Wow. That's amazing, yeah. right? Yeah, the pandemic webinar. How about that? You know, and on we go. <laughs> I know, right? Um, <laughs> Let's see, let's give people a couple minutes. Um, of course, we'll be answering some questions today about your bird. Um, and let me see, I wanna make this, uh, okay, I'm gonna try sharing something real quick while people are logging in. Um, hopefully it's not gonna do my whole screen. Okay, share screen. Ah, can you see this? Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. I saw that photo. I thought it was so cool. <laughs> it takes like, you a while to get your, you know, your bearings because you think it's a tree, right? Yeah. Initially, when you look at it, and then you go like, uh, no, it's not attached to anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you're wondering, like, was he on the branch? And then like the, you know, the big, is it a hawk took, you know, decided to break it off? Or is he like, hey, I'm going to just hitch a ride with you or, or by... <laughs> Yeah, it, it looks like an osprey to me and a, a little red winged blackbird actually uh, on there. Um, uh, but uh, I, I can't, I, I'm more, more uh, confident that it's an osprey, but uh, the red wing, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's a, a red patch of feathers on that blackbird there. So yeah. we'll go with that. Yeah, and the funny the funny thing is, if he falls off, he'll be fine because he'll just fly away. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but I was uh, I've uh, always been amazed on how how the the little birds will go after like the hawks and the you know the eagles. Like you just would assume that like the hawk or eagle would just be like, hey, I could take you, but you know they must not like that little like like a. It's almost like if you had a little tiny yipey dog that was trying to nip at you, you wouldn't be terrified, but you'd be a little bit annoyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it would be all over if it if it was able to grab them, but that's the key. Can they yeah. you know maneuver as quickly as those little birds? You know, I think that's that's one of the things about it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I thought that was I thought that was fun. Oh <laughs> so. uh, yes, very much so. Very much yeah. so. I mean, it's amazing to think that the photographer was there at the right time, the right place to capture photos like that. It's like, yeah, well, you know, with uh, your phone cameras, uh, that you know, it's in, in, the, in the old days, it was like, boy, if I had a camera right now, yeah, how do you do, you know, so that's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like now you, now you have no excuse not to take these awesome photos. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's see, you probably have um a good uh, amount of our people logged in hopefully for today. And just a reminder that um, if you have a question for Dr. Tolley to use the Q&A button um, and not the chat feature. And then um, let's see, I guess, uh, well, it looks like we will have some questions coming now. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, Dr. Tolley, uh, we'll just dive right in with the that first question. Great. That sounds okay. great. So this one comes from Jane and Jane says, does fatty liver disease uh, predispose the liver to infections or tumor development in budgies? Uh, will, um, will any malfunction of the liver cause a change in the plasma color to be, um, I think it's esoteric in the CBC or is it specific to fatty liver? Um, so Jane has a seven-year-old budgie whose appetite and energy was a bit down. And when the vet ran the CBC and the, uh, the plasma color was Okay, two plus slash three, um, is it uh, astroteric? Is that you say that? Uh, slight lip, uh, lip, <laughs> I'm gonna kill some words, I apologize. Uh, lipemia, uh, w, WBC. Lipemic. Lipemic. Yeah, lipemic. Uh, and the WBC was eight. Fecal exam was also done, the results of that, nothing abnormal. Um, so now the budgie's on milk thistle and uh, lactulose permanently and two antibiotics for two weeks if they're, well, is an infection in the liver, um, would not the WBC be elevated? Uh, let's see what else. Um, that's a, that's a mouthful. Yeah. And also it goes, uh, so she's, <laughs> I've had several budgies, uh, present like this over the years and told that they had fatty liver upon necropsy tumors involving the liver were noted. 
Um, is there any test that would reveal if we are actually dealing with a tumor and not fatty liver or in addition to fatty liver? And just for the record, the diet is pellets, seed, chopped fresh veggies daily, occasional uh, quinoa and egg white and no fruit. Mm -hmm. so there you go. That's a complete history there. Whoa, yeah. that was great, Dane. I tell you what, where do I even start with that? <laughs> I would I would say, you know, as far as, uh, you know, hepatic lipidosis or fatty liver uh, that uh, the uh, birds, this is uh, uh, a condition that birds can have uh, where there's fat deposition within the liver tissue itself. Other animals can have it uh, for sure. Um, uh, we, you know, uh, in rabbits uh, being one uh, that I see, <clears throat> uh, but uh, other, other animals, reptile, they can all have that. We can all have that, humans also. Now, of course, um, there is a, uh, the liver, as we all know, is a very forgiving organ, thank goodness, uh, for us that have a drink or so every once in a while. Um, but, uh, and so it takes uh, quite a bit of uh, fat deposition uh, in the liver uh, to have um, a, an abnormal function develop. And so therefore it's very difficult to determine when that occurs until the liver can't function anymore. One day it is, and then the next second it isn't. And so, and then they say, oh, look how bad it was. But that just shows you how well the liver uh, can function in the face of having pathology or abnormal um, condition. And so, that's it's difficult to test for um and because you're dealing with such small little birds um and that's kind of a, a double positive there small and little uh, and so you're looking at 30 gram birds uh, trying to determine the significance of that on say an x-ray is is difficult so when you're talking about you mentioned the uh, the complete blood count, which is a, a wonderful means of trying to determine if there's inflammation going on. It doesn't tell you that there's an infection by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it, it tells you that there's inflammation. Now, the inflammation can be and often is associated with an infectious process, but it can be uh, non-infectious. Uh, so, um, if, if uh, you're correct in the fact that uh, a CBC, if you have a, a, a hepatitis, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, uh, then it would occur. Uh, you may have an increase in the, the, uh, the white blood cell count, uh, total white blood cell count. Um, and that's just simply kind of defining that. Uh, if it was a tumor, uh, that's one of the difficulties in trying to diagnose um, cancer, neoplasia, uh, in, in, in any animal, including humans. If the animal isn't feeling well, well, sometimes and, and, and there's not a large mass or something of this nature. It's hard to say that it's a cancer because you're not going to possibly you're not going to have any um, blood abnormalities. You may not see that on a on a complete blood count. So if it is a, a, a hepatic or liver tumor, uh, there is a possibility that you would not see that um, on a CBC. Possibly you would have uh, uh, that on a, a chemistry panel. Uh, that would denote some liver enzymes that are elevated, or if you run a bile, bile acid test that would look for liver function, that that would be um, elevated. But <laughs> here we go again, 30 grams. How much blood can we take safely from a little 30 gram bird? And that's three tenths of a mil. Just enough for a complete blood count, nothing else. Uh, if we were dealing with a bald eagle, uh, macaw, say even an African gray, 
we can we can get four mils of blood. So we can run a number of tests. Even a cockatiel, we could get a mill of blood. But for a budgie, it's much more difficult. And so uh, when you're looking at the uh, the hepatic lipidosis here, that is a possibility um, on that. Budgies, um, a number <coughs> hepatic tumors are not uncommon in budgies, and um, and it's it, it's difficult to identify it. The only way that I can tell you, if you were looking at a diagnostic test, um, would be, and, and you're talking about a small bird here, and this even makes it more difficult, but if you were looking at a larger bird, uh, you can do an ultrasound guided biopsy. And then even in a small bird, like a budgie, you could do a liver biopsy, uh, but that's a surgical procedure. It's uh, also very you know, there is risk involved anytime you go under general anesthesia. So um, you can, you can uh, do a biopsy or what we call a fine needle aspirate where you put a needle in there and you can aspirate that tissue and the cells that you aspirate can be, be uh, actually observed uh, by a clinical pathologist to identify that and often they can determine if it's a fatty uh, liver hepatic lipidosis or uh, neoplastic or cancer cells. So, in general, that's that's what you're that's what you're um, that's what you're looking at. And um, again, proper diet nutrition helps reduce the incidence of hepatic lipidosis. But just I believe, just like uh, uh, atherosclerosis, where you have uh, arterial uh, blockage, uh, like in humans and birds, um, and in um, iron storage disease that occurs <clears throat> in toucans and uh, minor birds, that you can, and diet will help reduce these disease conditions. But, you know, you know people that have high cholesterol and they're on medication, they're on diet, and, 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 and we're not even talking medication here for birds, but we're talking, you know, if they went on a low cholesterol diet and they go to the physician and it's like they get their cholesterol test back and it's elevated still. And they go, but I'm, all I'm eating is hay, you know? I, you know, why is my cholesterol still out? It's because there's a genetic predisposition that you're just lucky to have and uh, are unfortunate to have. And that's what, what occurs here. So there are, are conditions and, and species of birds that are predisposed to certain disease conditions. We can do things to help reduce the incidence of those disease conditions, but for the most part, we can't prevent it. So delaying and reducing it. And so that's where a good husbandry, good nutrition come into play. There you go. Ah, okay. That was a very thorough answer uh, to a very thorough question. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, yeah. Next question comes from SG. Um, they have a 24 year old cockatiel with a mass on the edge of his left wing, which is growing. Um, it's beginning to bother him enough that he has started to, uh, biting at it and it has grown considerably in the past few weeks. A fine needle aspirate showed no malignant cells. One possible treatment I've been told to consider is a partial wing amputation. Uh, can you please tell me what I should weigh in on on making a decision about this? I know it's a high risk procedure. My cockatiel is otherwise very healthy, eating well, maintaining weight, playing with toys, singing, et cetera. And the procedure would be performed by a board certified surgeon. So what's your take on that? Um, well, uh, it, it's a, uh, 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 as we always have, Laura, it's a great question. Uh, it's, it's a great question and thank you so much for uh, participating in the webinar and sharing with the group because um, this is a situation that um, on a couple of fronts that um, is, is, is something that I, I see um, quite often. Uh, one, where you have a, uh, a tissue mass on an extremity, um, a wing or a leg, but let's say a wing, uh, <clears throat> or you have wing trauma. Mm -hmm. And the second 
is the whole aspect of the wing amputation. Okay. Now, uh, the, the problem that you have when you're talking about a mass on the wing um, is that if uh, a fine needle aspirate uh, is, is something that, as I mentioned with our, okay, it was a nice segue, uh, with our liver <clears throat> uh, as a diagnostic test to, to try to determine what was, um, uh, you know, the, the liver health, uh, if you have a mass, a fine needle aspirate is used to determine what the, the mass would, would may be. It could be an abscess. It could be uh, um, um, just inflammatory tissue, um, or it could be a, a, a tumor, among other things. Mm -hmm. But often, because you're aspirating cells from the, the mass, it's non-diagnostic. So you, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. And the clinical pathologist in the results will say, well, you need to get a biopsy. So that is an option is to get a small piece of that mass and submit it. Okay. It may not change what the end result is, <clears throat> but it may give you uh, other options. The problem with the mass at the tip of the wing is, is there's not much tissue there to close that if it is involving uh, much of the, the skin and underlying tissue. There's not much skin to close that. And um, so depending on how big it is, I think it was a cockatiel. Was it a cockatiel? Yes, a 24-year-old cockatiel. Yeah, and a 24-year-old yeah. cockatiel, it could be a squamous cell carcinoma, which is not uncommon. And often it's just removal of that, that um, mass. And usually if you can get a good um, area around that, um, that it is usually some, doesn't come back at least at that site. But again, you don't have that luxury on the wing to get that much tissue because you can't, it's difficult to close. Now, <clears throat> but like I said, a biopsy would be something that you could consider. Now you can say, well, let's just go ahead and amputate that wing. Usually with the, the birds, um, I will, if there's a wing, injury um, to the distal part of the wing uh, that is going to be difficult to heal or there's the possibility of an infection or if um, you know if if it doesn't appear that it's going to be uh, the bird will recover in a manner that uh, and quickly and and happily mm -hmm. that the 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 uh, the the um the prospect of an amputation and this is one one is that if they luxate their elbow that's not an uncommon in, injury where the elbow goes out of joint in a bird and so this is a very difficult um um i guess condition to treat um and so the wing is kind of uh out of uh, kind of uh, position. And so this could affect the bird. You know, in some of these cases, and, and, and we're again talking about the, a mass, and they mentioned wing amputation. Mm -hmm. If you amputate the wing at the, at, the, at the humerus, the long bone right next to the shoulder, between the shoulder and the elbow, right in the middle, um, the bird does extremely well. Um, you can't even when the when the um, the all the feathers grow back. It's going to be very difficult for you to tell that there's any anything, you know, that anything happened to the bird. But the 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 difficulty is that when people when you mention amputation, that's a, a kind of a negative connotation, and it's and people kind of say, "Gosh, I don't want the wing cut off. I don't want a limb cut off." 
but in certain circumstances, if it's if it's a if it's a recommendation or it's going to be better for the bird in the long run, or you're talking about the possibility of treating uh, a cancerous area, um, then it's it, it, the bird's going to recover and do so well that it's not like it's going to it even happened. Um, and of course, we're talking, you know, the bird will not be able to fly naturally, but at the same time, the bird uh, does extremely well with that. And the surgery for itself, if, you know, does it need to be a board certified surgeon? I'm not a board certified surgeon, and I've done many uh, of these over the few years that I've been in practice. Um, but with that in, in mind, it's, it's not a, a difficult surgery, but if somebody is confident that, uh, that they, they are, are comfortable with it, uh, then, then no, it doesn't have to be a board certified surgeon. It doesn't have to be a, a board certified avian specialist either uh, for that matter. Um, I know uh, a number of uh, excellent uh, veterinarians that have done this. Um, so that's uh, <clears throat> you know my thoughts on that. And and so uh, the one thing that I want to add is that it's still surgery. You're still going under general anesthesia. There are risks involved, um, but if you, it's not a complicated surgery, but at the same time the patient has to. Uh, you know, survive and make it through the, the anesthesia. Um, and that's, that's no different than humans or whatever that uh, have anesthesia. Um, it, you, when you go under general anesthesia, uh, you have to sign a waiver. Uh, if you're going to go under general anesthesia that states this can kill you and that I am aware of that and I am going to uh, acknowledge that and uh, agree to go under general anesthesia, knowing that it can kill me. So that's what you have to sign if you actually go under general anesthesia. And so that's basically what you have to sign with your bird when they go under uh, general anesthesia from any veterinarian that I'm aware of, that you're aware of the risk involved in general anesthesia, not just the surgery. Um, it's, it's not uh, a common occurrence that they would die under general anesthesia, um, but it does happen and it will happen. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, that's all has to be taken into consideration when you're faced with the options that are for this particular condition. Wow. That's, a, and I, you know, um, post-operation, uh, pain management, is there, when, when you're, say your bird has the wing amputated, when you're sent home, uh, do they send you home with like a, something that you syringe for pain management? Just curious. Yes, on yes, yeah, oh yes. Uh, analgesia, pain management. Um, this is something that, um, that is in, 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 in my, <clears throat> my career, uh, pain management has, is one of the areas that I would say is uh, advanced um, as as much as anything in medicine, um, and uh, it's it's a good thing. I think it's advanced better in veterinary medicine than human medicine, where it just uh, kind of went off the tracks, um, yeah. unfortunately. But um, the uh, pain management has. Uh, in sedation of our patients to make sure that when they come into the clinic um, and they're uh, having even grooming procedures that are done, um, that they're uh, being sedated so it's not as stressful for them uh, as it was uh, 30 years ago, and that when they leave that they are on uh, pain management, whether it's uh, um, uh, an NSAID, something uh, akin to, to your, your Advil or uh, something of that nature, um, and, and um, possibly uh, there's, there's other uh, opioid drugs that we, we can manage uh, some of our, our patients on. 
So this is uh, definitely, um, as I mentioned so, uh, to the question, yes, it would be on pain medication and management and uh, something that has been one of the biggest advancements of any in veterinary medicine over the last 20 to 30 years. Interesting. Um, all right, now we're going to move on to a, a different uh, kind of question here from Cindy. Uh, Cindy wants to know, uh, can I use bath and body wall plugins in, in the house with my kike? Um, it doesn't spray, it's the vanilla scent. So I think it's like from, uh, from a bath and body um, shop and it's the little plug-in scent. Um, uh, it doesn't spray, but it heats up to emit the scent. So is that safe to use around birds? I would be very careful with that. Um, I would be very careful. I the uh, um, the the chemical composition that is um, emitted into the environment uh, from the source from the heat um, of that plug-in. Uh, I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, in, uh, the, in in particular that brand. Um, but, uh, you know, I know that the Glade plugins uh, have been known to uh, cause issues, um, in particular, uh, as a brand. Um, if you don't have birds, they're probably, probably good. I, I, I don't know. But, um, but it, it's concerning to me uh, that I just that, that I, I am aware of that. We actually had one, one bird that came into the uh, uh, hospital um, that was actually a student, uh, one of our veterinary students' birds. It was a little cockatiel and it would come in and she would, she would bring it in. It would have uh, respiratory difficulty breathing and it was uh, noticeable, you know, and it was like, gosh, you know, just having difficulty uh, breathing and uh, it wasn't uh, active. And so it, we keep in the hospital and we, we did some testing. We couldn't really find anything specific with it, but while we were just treating and supporting it and providing um, uh, fluid therapy and, and, um, and uh, nutritional support and it, the bird would improve. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, and then she'd take it home a day or two later and come back in same problem. And then finally figured out that it was a, and this happened over three or four times before we finally got down to the point. It was a, a plug in. So any type of candles, uh, I, I have candles in my house and, uh, and, and birds. And I, and so the ones that I use, it, it, it doesn't affect the birds. But you have to be careful, and uh, with any, and I, I'm not it, it definitely not advocating. But their respiratory systems are so sensitive that um, I would be careful with anything, and especially the plug-ins um, on that. And if you do see uh, any evidence of the bird having difficulty breathing, um, if you know, you would you know, want to. Uh, stop that, but I, I would be very careful with that and wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Is that the same with uh, products? Like, would you be cautious using like Febreze, which is like a scented spray that you might, it doesn't heat up, but you spray it as an aerosol in a room to make it have a fresh scent. Um, you know, uh, for the, for the, for the most part, um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I would try to make sure that uh, I would reduce any of the um, uh, any of the spray toward the bird and make sure that it's somewhat disseminated within the environment and try to spray away from the bird um, uh, in, in, in in general uh, with the number of birds over the years that have been exposed to different aerosol products and things, um, they seem to be fairly um, amenable to, to having uh, some of the products like you're talking about, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they, uh, but you don't want to uh, over 
saturate the environment with with that um, by any any means. And, and and as we know about smoke and Teflon, um, you know, lined pans, um, that is that is um, uh, it kind of has a significant um, uh, impact on the lungs and can kill the birds. Um, but uh, in, in, in smoke of any kind is, is um, problematic. But, you, you know, if you have any, any um, uh, doubt whether um, there's something uh, like, you know, paint, fresh paint um, or, or any aerosol, just remove the bird from that environment. You can spray it and then bring it back. You know, put it in a carrier, put it out for an hour or two, and then bring it back in. It'll be fine, yeah. you know. So that would be my thoughts. Okay. Uh, and then our next question is from Eileen. It's actually a two-part question. Um, first part is, what could be the reason for open mouth breathing occasionally that is relieved by a humidifier? And then the second question is, also, can parrots eat eggs? I know that they shouldn't have people food, but... Is this a definite no-no? So, um, the um, what could be open mouth breathing that could be um, uh, that could be kind of helped with a uh, humidifier? Mm -hmm. Is that what it, what it what? Uh, yeah, the, it's relieved I, by a humidifier. Relieved by a humidifier. I guess the the thought there is um, how how often does the um, the bird um, you know open mouth breathe? Um, the one thing that I would I would I would look at is to see how significant this this open mouth breathing is, um, and is it related to a respiratory condition? Um, some and, and you say, "Well, open mouth breathing—that's that's abnormal." Um, well, sometimes it can be behavioral uh, on that, um, and the just the humidification in the air. Uh, we've nebulized birds, and they start singing. It's just like it's kind of a fog, and they they enjoy that that whole environment. So, it could be psychological, behavioral to stop the the uh, open mouth breathing uh on that um but i guess it can be correlated to um uh, a, a, a possibly helping with a disease condition um or something that it that, you know, disease just being abnormal um but if everything else is normal with the bird there's no nasal discharge uh the bird's eating maintaining normal weight looks good uh, stools normal. There's nothing else. Then, then um, I would say that that's probably uh, not not an issue. And that if it's open mouth breathing because it can't get air, like a little cockatiel eats peanut butter cracker and gets peanut butter in its mouth and it can't breathe, you know, then that would be more. Um, you know, you know that there, there's a significant problem, or if it, if it inhales a seed, uh, if it inhales a seed uh, down its trachea, which has happened, then, then it's not going to have intermittent open mouth breathing. It will be open mouth breathing and, 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 and you know, uh, a vaporizer is gonna help. Um, and so also you look at the tail, the tail on a bird, uh, should be when it's breathing steady, but if it's bobbing like this, mm -hmm. that means that it's using its body. <gasps> it's trying to breathe like that, like after a run. And so that's what it's doing. And so every time, <gasps> so that's, that's usually means that there is a, a respiratory condition going on. Uh, that's, that's problematic. Now, if it's sitting there open mouth breathing and the tail's like this, then it's not that, um, you're not gonna think that it's that much of a disease condition of significance without any other clinical signs. Mm -hmm. This is where, when you go in for a physical exam, that's where you say, oh, 
you know, why do I need to take, why do I need a complete blood count? You know, looks good, you know. And this is where when you do a complete blood count, you can see, is there inflammation going on? Is there anything that may be associated with that? Um, where you look inside, just like, again, when I say we go in for physical exams, mm -hmm. the doctor just doesn't look at us and go, hey, you're looking good. See you later. You know, go get your blood work and we're going to look at all of that. So that's the same way. And so that's how you can tell on that. So there's a few things um, that kind of explain why just open mouth breathing when you nebulize, it seems to get better, but it's still, you know, it, 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 it may be a problem, but in, without anything else, it, it may just be kind of a behavioral or uh, a way for the bird to say, hey, I think I'm going to, I want a little, little foggy mist right now. I'm going to, I'm going to open mouth breathe. And when I do that, I get a foggy mist, you know, so he may have trained you. I don't know. <laughs> That's one thing that can, you can consider. And then the other question was. Well, it was about can birds, can parrots eat eggs? Um, can they eat eggs? Yeah. Yeah. What do you say, Laura? You know, I, uh, my birds used, well, a lot of my birds loved eggs. <laughs> Scrambled yeah, eggs was like a yeah, favorite. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's, I, I like a diversified diet. They may say, well, not the yolk or what have you. Uh, but at the same time, I think in moderation, it's not going to uh, uh, be problematic. You know? Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, Glenna says that one of my three adult male rescue budgies adopted six months ago has had three episodes in two weeks of falling off the perch and spinning in a tight circle with his right leg pulled up into his body and the right wing extended but not flapping it's over in less than a minute and he will fly to a nearby perch preen sing eat as usual um he also makes a very odd small repetitive chirp he's larger than the others um maybe he's part english budgie and um, and he is less active uh and agile the three other birds stop and watch. Um, if it is a stupider disease, can this be accurately tested? He is experiencing pain during these episodes. Is he experiencing pain during these episodes? Is it treatable? And his history is un unknown. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, and uh, it's nice that you have uh, rescue budgies. Thank you for doing that. Uh, really appreciate it. And I understand that, um, uh, that uh, you wouldn't have a history, so we don't know what the age is, and and uh, it it it, it uh, and I think that all of the participants can agree that this sounds almost like seizure activity uh, mm -hmm. to me uh, and to everybody else on the on the uh, little webinar today. Uh, with that, um, it it's it's. Um, it's difficult to say uh, what what it is, uh, and and uh, but if you're looking at at the possibilities, uh, pituitary adenomas, uh, it could be uh, we have had uh, budgies with with uh, uh, cancer, um, uh, pituitary cancer, uh, um, tumors uh, that actually have seizure activity. Um, this is unfortunately one of the the differentials that I would I would I would go to uh, considering if the bird is uh, in good body condition uh, eats well uh, up to this point um, but with uh, seizure activity with like this I would I would have to say I would I would not um, I, I would think vestibular disease would be um, one of my top differentials in, in, in a budgie uh, exhibiting this, I would go more toward a, a, a possible neoplasia uh, with that. Although it could be vestibular disease, um, but that's not something that we commonly see, but medicine, uh, we see uh, there's rarely a day that I come in that I go, I haven't seen that before. You know, that's what makes it so fun. Right. Um, 
that it's always something new. Yeah, interesting. Um, and and uh, Frank wanted to know, uh, let's see, uh, male cockatiel um, had, okay, this is, I'm gonna read this, um, had A-S-T, uh, and he has in parentheses S-G-O-T, of 26, 24 at age seven with a normal of 20 to 350. He is fine today at age 11 in my, and eight months with only change being seed, at, he's changed from seed to Lefebvre nutriberries. Could the diet change do this? Uh, the, the one thing that you have to remember about some of the enzymes that, and this is um, what, uh, I, I always take into consideration when I'm thinking about diagnostic testing um, is, and, and I always say that I try to, um, <clears throat> I try to have an idea of, of uh, before I do the diagnostic test of what the results are going to be. Um, you know, unless I'm just trying to, um, find out what the general condition of the bird is, if it's critical or if it comes in and that we're going to do a procedure that I just need to know what the, the overall condition of the bird is in. Um, if I'm going to order a diagnostic test, I try to determine, okay, what, what's the blood glucose going to be? What's the uric acid level going to be? What's the AST, ALT, CK gonna be? And these are all enzymes. And there's many different, well, there's uh, some enzymes are more specific and other enzymes that you get um, uh, results for um, are uh, less specific, meaning other parts of the body can 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 um, contribute to that. So so if you're looking at um, uh, AST ALT, which are enzymes that are associated li with liver, there can be some influence of muscle enzymes uh, in those results. So it's muscle and liver. And if there are elevated uh, muscle enzymes uh, in the bird, well, that'll make the AST and, and ALT, and for the most part, a little bit, you know, it'll influence and make them higher. So I, I say that in that um, you're, you know, asking would, would uh, you know, the bird's enzymes are normal now, you know, versus when, when they were in seven years. So let's say just four years ago. Um, well, what was the condition of the bird and what happened and why were, you know, unless it was just an annual physical exam, you know, the, you know, there could have been influence from other things for those enzyme levels that aren't there now. And, and so the, the, the other influence is not there, so they're more normal. And, um, and if you have normal enzyme, I'll, I'll just say this, that if you have a good diet um, and the bird is on a, a, a good diet, well, that will increase your chances of having normal enzyme levels, whether it affected in, you know, this, this case in particular, because we just don't know how the bird was when, when they were elevated and what happened. Who knows, it may, have, it may have caught its leg in the cage you didn't know and had some muscle damage and that made it high, higher or what have you. But for the most part, if you have good nutrition, it, it, will, it will increase your chances of having the bird in good health and the bird in good health, you'll have, uh, for the most part, your 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 blood results uh, and your enzyme levels will be uh, normal within normal limits. Okay. And then our next question is from Janice, and it's an eye question. Um, so Janice says that uh, my African gray attacked my Jende conure, and she sustained an eye injury. The vet said that there's lots of blood behind her eye and it doesn't know if it's the, if the retina is detached. 
the vet also said she might lose vision in that eye. So um, she's on drops to hopefully clear the blood and um, meloxicam and an antibiotic. So um, Janice's question is, I very much, uh, says, I very much trust my avian vet, but are there ophthalmologists for birds that can take a closer look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are veterinary ophthalmologists, and I'm sure you're, you know, it sounds like you're, your bird's getting well taken care of. And so that's fantastic. Um, and, uh, but there are uh, veterinary ophthalmologists uh, that um, would, uh, would examine uh, bird eyes and uh, whether one is near you or not, uh, if you would, uh, I, I don't, I don't know of any veterinarian, um, uh, and I'm sure there are some, but uh, that would would uh, discourage somebody from wanting to see a specialist if they wanted to. Um, I encourage that. Um, I just happen to work with a lot of specialists here at the school, so if I need the ophthalmologist to look at it, I'll take it down the hall. But wow. uh, but but none the nonetheless, uh, yes, there are veterinary ophthalmologists out there, and they. They are excellent and they know a lot about eyes and they can do fantastic eye surgery. But uh, I can tell you uh, that it sounds like you are, uh, your bird's getting well taken care of. Okay. And then Kathy has a, a three-year-old cockatiel um, that has had greenish yellow stools since last year. Um, he's been on um, metronidazole. Metronidazole. Thank you. With no change. I, I do it, Laura. I mean, my goodness gracious. I mean, <laughs> I know, I'm I, sorry I, killing words. I can, I can I can send you some here that are like, where do you even start? Metronidazole. Yeah. Yes. That's Thank an you. easy one, actually. Is it? Okay. Just don't put me on a spelling test on these. Uh, no, no. So they're on metro, that, what you said, metronidazole, uh, with no change. And now he's on um, Tylosin tartrate powder, uh -huh. two, two teaspoons per gallon of water and going on four gallons so far this year. And there's no change um, after almost a year of this treatment. So what's your take on that? So it's a cockatiel? Yes, three years old. A three years old cockatiel. And it has? Greenish yellow stools. And they've had, them. the, the bird has had it since last year. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing, first of all, I would, I would go like, um, what, what is the, um, um, well, uh, what I, I would say, I'd say, uh, what's the diet? What's the bird, bird eating? That's, that's the first thing. Anytime uh, in, it's being offered, uh, not only being offered, because you could, you can offer a bird a lot of things and it's going to only eat one thing, you know offer a hyacinth macaw, a, a beautiful buffet and macadamia nuts and all it eats is the macadamia nuts, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> so what's the bird eating? That may, that, that, that can often uh, influence the color of the stool and also the consistency of the stool. Um, and uh, so, so after that, then um, what's the bird's general condition? Um, is the bird uh, losing weight, gaining weight? How does it look? Does it look good? Um, is, uh, you, know, you know, with a cockatiel, you could do a complete blood count. You can do a CBC, um, a look at that. Um, and then, <clears throat> then, then also, um, you know, with, with that, uh, you can, you can also, uh, if, if there's nothing there, um, you know, then there's some other tests that you can do. And, and what I'm, I'm getting at is that can try to identify to see if there is a problem. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, you know, the stool doesn't look normal. But is there a disease causing this problem? And if everything is normal or negative, and you can include some parasite test on that, which is where is it going to get exposed? But you could you could do that. Um, 
culture. You can culture the, um, the, the cloaca to see if there's any abnormal bacteria that may be causing that, um, uh, or at the very least do a stain. And if everything's normal or negative and the bird looks good and there's nothing else wrong with the bird, then I would, I would, I would have to say, let's see how the bird does and uh, going forward, you know? So uh, I think that what I would try to look at maybe is the testing to try to, to confirm that this is in fact a disease condition. Okay. Um, and that... then, yeah. <laughs> That's a kind of a reminder that when you bring your bird in for a checkup, you might want to roll up the, the, um, the, the bottom, like if you have a newspaper or a cage liner, so they can get a look at the droppings as well for overall yeah. health. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then, yeah, sorry. I have another question for you. Um, this one is from Darren. Um, Darren has a red fronted macaw that had a full uh, blood count um, recently. The results today showed high uric acid and he was advised to up the fruit offerings. So the macaws always had, um, is always healthy diet is not changed recently, uh, a healthy diet that hasn't changed recently. And he regurgitates the toys, me and almost anything. And this increases this time of year, though it is always more frequent regularly than I'm guessing it should be. Could this be the cause of the high uric um, acid result. Uh, urates are also quite yellow occasionally at this time. Um, if so, how do I reduce this habit that he has? Well, um, that's, that's more of a behavioral issue. And I, I think that uh, one thing that they uh, can look at to try to and get, get a few more questions. Can I know that uh, we have some behavior webinars uh, and I would recommend that. I think uh, um, as yeah. Chris Davis uh, has done, done some and that's something that I would encourage you to do is look at that as far as behavior to try to reduce that. The uric acid, what, um, a, a couple of things on that. One is uh, I'm not really sure how, what, what would be elevated in this red front macaw? Um, you know what 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 you're considering elevated based or on the on the test results. What I can tell you is that in general with birds, if you have a high or elevated uric acid level, it's usually related to dehydration. Um, and again, I'm not. I just don't know in the in the what this how how elevated these, these are. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what we're looking at because sometimes uh, it can, can, can um, with other animals, um, kidney uh, disease can cause this, um, uh, a high uric acid or BUN, blood urea nitrogen in, in mammals. But um, the, uh, for, the, for birds, uh, when the renal function gets to the point where you have increased uric acid level, usually the bird is in very critical shape. Doesn't appear that that's the case here. So if it is elevated, then it's likely more of a, of a dehydration or needs to be more hydrated. Uh, I'm not sure if the, how often the bird regurgitates, um, but it, you know, what you're saying, it, it appears to be more behavioral than a, a disease condition because uh, regurgitation can occur for a number of reasons in birds. Uh, one, zinc toxicosis uh, can cause this. Uh, of course, bacterial infections uh, can cause a regurgitation. And, uh, and then again, uh, we've had uh, regurgitation with tumors. Not saying that that's anything here, um, but um, but uh, you seem to have a cause and effect in a time of year when this this occurs and how it occurs. But um, and so I'm I'm taking it that you have that in hand. But I'm just kind of for the for the group just mentioning as far as regurgitation, it's not always behavioral and it can be 
a disease process over and above some type of a, a foreign body in the in the crop. So um, that's that's my thoughts on that. Okay, and then uh, Gloria wants your take on this scenario. Uh, have you seen many cockatoos or other birds resting on their hawks, which has the front claws up in the air? And they use the tail as a, a support for this inclined position. So the bird's kind of leaning, leaning in a lean in an inclined position, resting on the hawks with the tail as a support. Yeah, um, we'll see that uh, uh, from time to time uh, on on different birds, but it, usually it's a bird that's uh, weak and doesn't want to stand on on uh, in a regular manner um i i don't know if this is kind of a what she's describing as something that's passing or if this is the way the bird actually perches or or sits on on a normal basis um but uh obviously it's not normal and um and, and we'll have birds that'll actually have smooth areas on the, on the, the where, where they have, um, they, they're just not, um, there's some type of uh, either uh, a structural or just a um, anatomical issue that's causing them to do that or, uh, I guess it could could be behavioral where they'll well they'll do that or if they're just weak uh, where that can occur. Uh, so those are some just different aspects of what why why it can occur. Um, and then we try to look and see when did it start, how long has it been going on, how often does it occur, and to try to see if there's any type of an underlying um explanation or reason for that um that may be related to something that occurred prior or some kind of a disease process that's ongoing okay is that something that you would notice as a being more inclined certain species over others or is that just I, it may be it may be but i haven't been able to um and and and, and I, I wouldn't say it's only cockatoos i've seen I've seen macaws that have uh, have done that, and uh, and and again, it's usually uh, correlated to some type of a condition that the animal has. It's not something that they would do. It's abnormal. Uh, obviously, okay. it's abnormal. But um, whether you can get to the explanation of why it's happening or not is a is a whole different story. You have to try to. To, to find out if um, you can correlate the onset to uh, some type of a, a disease condition. Okay, and then uh, I, this might be our final question. I have a question from Nikki. Uh, I have a 30 year old male eclectus who has to have his beak and nails trimmed every three months. Uh, what could cause him to grow so fast? So he's on a diet of uh, Lefebvre Nutriberries, pellets, fresh fruit and veggies, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, <clears throat> I wish I could I could tell him um, why. Uh, I just uh, mm, I just uh, trimmed a, an eclectus uh, beak uh, yesterday. Um, I, I just uh, uh, I guess. You know, so so oh. yeah. Uh, so yeah, and it's a male eclectus. So um, yeah, I wish I could tell you why that is the case. Um, and and uh, this one, uh, I didn't. I trimmed uh, actually a year ago, so it, it wasn't quite every three months. Uh, but obviously, it was long. So you may not let yours grow that long, uh, your birds, but. Uh, is, it's been attributed to uh, a few things. Uh, one of the uh, reasons is if there's malocclusion that occurs and the beak doesn't meet properly, uh, mm -hmm. then then you will have some uh, overgrowth on that. 
Um, but the, this bird, this bird appears to be normal. The, the, the claws were normal. The, the nails were norm. I mean, long, but, um, <clears throat> on this, uh, so they needed to be trimmed also. So th this bird's very similar to yours. And I, then the students asked me, doc, why is this, that? you know, and, and it's been attributed possibly to some, uh, uh, you know, increased uh, liver involvement or, you know, liver condition the, and, and the patho and, and, the, and the correlation between that and the growing of the beak. Um, I, I don't, I don't see it. It could be. And so the bottom line is that other than malocclusion, I can't explain why, you know, why the the birds beaks grow uh that quickly uh and the claws it's a great question as have all the questions been yeah. today yeah. but we have some unknowns a lot of unknowns and uh i feel that's that's just one of them there's some theories like i said the liver increased liver uh you can take uh, test and all the liver inside everything the bile acid i mean the uh, yeah, bile acid liver function is normal but uh no um, what about species are there certain bird species that you see more often than others like leclectus for like uh weeks? no not really it just was coincidental you know with uh you know that uh, had an eclectus yesterday uh, but i've seen uh, macaws uh, where the beaks actually you know it kind of curved back around so um so it's it's i don't you know most of the time that people bring in the birds for grooming it's for smoothing of the beak not yeah. trimming and so it's rare that we have to trim the beak um but uh and and i've seen it in in a number of species and it appears that it, the collectus is the bird du jour but as far as other birds uh i can't say that 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 would be one of the the, the common ones but we okay. can see it they're, rep probably, they're they're well represented <laughs> and probably a cautionary uh the statement that don't trim your don't try to trim your bird's beak yourself because that could go bad it's a very no, sensitive I, organ correct actually actually this was an eclectus too thank you uh laura this was an eclectus too um it it flew into a wall or it, it cracked its beak uh and um actually uh, just about bled to death because the the beak is uh, that's a whole we can do that you know talk about that or lead off next time i think we may have already um but it can it can bleed and the bird can die from that so you want to be very very careful uh and you you know really if you if you have somebody that can do it uh you know, your veterinarian then that's that's good but the eclectus lived that almost bled to death. It needed a transfusion wow. and uh, it took about a week to recover, but it did. But uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that point up. All right. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna announce today's winner because we, we have a giveaway um, like we do on our webinars every time we do this together. Um, we're gonna give away a bag of the Lefebvre tropical fruit pellets, as well as another bag of Lefebvre food of your choice. Uh, today's winner uh, goes out to Nikki. So Nikki D, you are the winner of today's giveaway. So congratulations. Hope that makes your weekend and your day. <laughs> congratulations, uh, Nikki. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. It's a it, it's a it's another good reason, it, not only for your awesome advice and take on on conditions, but also free food. How cool is that? <laughs> so, yes. yes, yes, yes um, very much so. so I was going to give everyone a sneak preview of our upcoming webinars. Uh, we don't have one next Friday. Hopefully everyone will enjoy a nice uh, Memorial weekend. Um, but we will be back on June 4th um, with Heart to Heart with Chris Davis. And then as a super sneak sneak preview, we also are going to have a, um, a new series, a new episode starting with uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb, and that's going to be the Avian Vet Insider. So um, she's going to give us uh, different takes on um, on cases. Uh, 
So the one for that, that episode, for example, that'll be on June 11th. She's going to give us the most common cases your avian veterinarian treats. So um, let's see. I think that is it uh, for today. Dr. Tolley, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to spend time with you on Friday and get uh, all this advice that nowhere else can you get such great advice for free <laughs> for your bird. So we <laughs> totally appreciate it. So. We try, and uh, and it's the great questions, and it's uh, and it's the people that are on this webinar. Thank you, Laura, and uh, and thank everybody uh, for uh, attending and, and providing the questions so that we can talk about our uh, the birds that we love, you know, and uh, and I and love it. Thank you. All right. On that note, I'm going to wish everyone a very happy weekend. All the best to you and your flock, and stay safe. Yes, next time. thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>